Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. I'm a little loud today, aren't I? Okay. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. It's good to see everybody here. Uh, for the mothers in the room, I hope that uh, today's a day of honor and joy for you um, and um, a, a day for family connections for everybody and for our visitors. I'm really glad that you're here. Um, it's nice to, nice to see you and, and um, hope this is a time of, of uh, encouragement and um, just good for you as well. Uh, we've been working through a bit of a series. It's, I didn't intend it to be a series when I started it, but it kind of grew into that. Um, but we've been talking about the um, implications of the gospel for our context today as we think about these questions of fellowship. Um, and so I want to continue to build on what we've, what we've talked about the last few times. But let's begin in prayer. Father, we love you and we're so grateful to be your children we're so grateful to be loved by you and to um, have the opportunity to seek you and to know you. We are blessed beyond measure. Give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear it. Um, please be with all of us, Lord, and draw us closer to you. Be with, our, be with us in our time together now, and, and may this be a time for wisdom and a time for growing, a time for growing closer to you and to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, as we've, as we've looked at the last few weeks, as we've, as we've said, you know, we, we recognize just at the, at the very beginning of all this that throughout church history and for, for many of us in this room, um, we, we've sort of experienced or thought about or approached the idea of fellowship through the lens of, of tradition, that, that fellowship was grounded on and defined by issues, uh, that the mark of who's in and who's out, uh, of who we have fellowship with and who we don't, is either certain beliefs or certain practices or certain views on certain issues or membership in a church that holds certain views on, on certain issues. And, and in the very first sermon, we just kind of stepped into considering um, the weakness and the fragility, and, and really the inconsistency and subjectivity of defining issues on, on or excuse me, defining fellowship on, on issues. Um, in the second, what we, what we looked at last week in Galatians, we saw that for Paul to, to uh, ground and define fellowship on anything other than Christ, he saw that as the ultimate defection from Christ, a distortion of the gospel, and he used the words of anathema to describe that kind of approach to this question of fellowship. So we're not talking about a, a light subject here or something that's sort of inconsequential or secondary or tertiary. For Paul, this question of fellowship was right here at this question of, of, of gospel, right? So for Paul um, to define fellowship on anything other than Christ, he said, was to nullify the grace of God and to, to render the death of Jesus as vain. In other words, we chuck out grace, we chuck out the cross if we define fellowship on any other terms. And, and that's despite any rhetoric we might say to the contrary. We might say, oh yeah, I still believe in the grace of God and the death of Jesus, but no, <laughs> Whether we, w whatever words we say, in effect, that's what we've, what we've done. For Paul, who was so captivated by Christ and the power of Christ crucified, the one who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, he said, for, for him, we are the people of God and thus have fellowship with each other as the people of God, he said, because of faith or because of Christ's faith, because of the faithfulness of Jesus in his death on the cross, and he's the one in whom we place our faith or give our allegiance. In other words, fellowship is grounded on and defined by Christ, who he is, what he's done, and our shared faith in him, our shared faithfulness to him, our shared allegiance to him. But here's also where the problem comes in, right? How do we then define faithfulness to Christ? Ah, there's the loophole, right? That's where, that's where we get it, right? No, how do we define faithfulness to Christ? For many... Issues have been so elevated and become so central and so weighty, they can't distinguish the issues from Christ. As if they're one and the same. They're so interconnected, so just hang together. For many, faithfulness to Christ is the same thing as agreeing with them on 
issues or going to a church that agrees with them on the same issues. I'm just saying these things have been elevated so far. This, that's where the hard work comes in is actually sort of stripping all that away and untangling that kind of knot that gets tied sometimes. Illustrate this a little bit. I, I, I used this passage in the first sermon, but you think about Matthew 7 where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And you can keep reading there. But as I, as I commented a few weeks ago, we recognize, I know many in this room have heard that verse quoted at different times in your life and then proceeded to say, and the denominations do this, 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 and this, right? Um, and, and realizing, what's he actually talking about in context? He's not talking about any of those issues that we might look down on other people about. He, he sums it up in treat others the way you want them to treat you, right? He sums up his whole sermon in that word. He sums up the whole his whole Bible, Law and the Prophets, in that same sentence, right? And, and you could unpack that more. You could say the poor in spirit, the meek, the mourners, the justice hungry, the merciful, the list goes on and on. Those who turn the other cheek, those who go the extra mile, um, those who, who are, are not worrying but learning this deep trust and faith, seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. We could go on and on about the, the more specific contents of the sermon that's what he's talking about. That's the will of the Father that he's, that he's talking about and saying lots of people will go the way of the scribes and the Pharisees and, and pursue religion and pursue God in all these different ways, but this is who God is. This is what God wants, and you can sum it up in the, the thing we teach our kids. Treat others the way you want them to treat you, right? Second John 9 might be another one we've heard. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Have you ever heard that verse used to talk about, you know, denouncing other people for their, uh, on the, this realm of issues but, but what is John talking about in that context? To see it in the fullest way, I'd say, man, let's work through the gospel of John and 1 John and 2 John and 3 John and see it all together to get the fullness of John's vision here. But we can just read a few verses earlier, and he says this, Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but one which we have from the beginning. Guess what it's going to say, guys? That we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we've accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. And then he goes on to say, anyone who goes too far, right? What is that word of Christ, that message of Christ that he's saying, don't go too far, but abide in? The command of Christ to love one another and the teaching that Jesus is the Christ who's come in the flesh. And for John, those two things stand and fall together because it's precisely through the fact that the Christ came in the flesh and gave himself on the cross that we know love <laughs> and that love gets in us and it's produced in us, right? So you see how it's all integrated for John, right? So my point in both of these examples is just recognizing that for many, these issues have become so elevated and, and become so central and so weighty that they're conflated with some of these lines and, and, and can't distinguish those issues from Christ and the way the scriptures are defining faithfulness to Christ. All right, so let's do a little case study together for a second. When I ask the question, how to recognize a sound church from an unsound church, okay? How do, we, how do we recognize? What's the test? I'll tell you kind of the test that I kind of grew up learning, okay? You're going to start with the sign. You're going to start with the, the name on the building or on the, on the sign out front. Does it say Church of Christ, okay? That's step one. But we recognize that's, that's not enough, right? Um, one data collector has recognized that as of last year, 2023, there were at least 10 distinct fellowship groups that all carry the name Church of Christ, okay? So in other words, the movement has so divided and subdivided over the years that now at least 10 claim the name Church of Christ, um, and that's not including divisions that would be like racial and ethnic, right? Like in, in some parts of the country, 
African American churches of Christ in function are their own distinct fellowship group, or you might say that in other, in other cases as well. So the name on the sign isn't enough, but there's other criteria that we can use. Do they have a church bus? Do they have a basketball goal or playground outside? Okay, so if we make it then through that test or those, those, those outside tests and venture in the building, do they have a kitchen? Do they have a fellowship hall? Do they have a piano, right? Is that the test? Is that the test? I, we're all, we all share the same heritage here, right? We all share, for the most part, we all have the same background. I'm not making something up that you've not heard. We've all heard that test, right? We, are we all familiar with that? But let me ask, is that the test? Biblically, is that meant to be the test? If we were simply studying the Bible in its context and then working hard to faithfully apply it in our context, is that the test we'd walk away with? without loading all our questions and assumptions and stuff in there, but just taking the Scriptures on its own terms. Is that what we'd walk away with? Or would we find ourselves spellbound and captivated and transformed by the words of Jesus when He says this, a new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another by this by this, all men, all people will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Do we see the difference between those two approaches? How different the other test is from what we're seeing in Scripture and the vast gap between the other approach to life in Christ and the teaching in the heart of Christ. And, and, and recognize in this context, the words of Jesus go well beyond ourselves, right? To, to see like how we would recognize each other. He's saying the whole world should be able to, to connect us to Jesus by the way we live. Let alone what we might recognize in each other, right? It's not just John's writings. If we go back to Paul and Galatians where we were last time and just keep going with his with his argument. He says in chapter 5, again, just a little bit of context for us. Again, uh, chapter 2 is where he really brings the central argument and, and, and lays that out in the stuff we looked at. Chapter 3 and 4, he expands it and just kind of looks at it from every angle to really help them kind of get this in their bones, that, that, that fellowship, that unity is not grounded on these issues are, you know, as I said last time, fill in the blank, but it's on Christ. It's on the faithfulness of Christ and our faithfulness to him. So after he's, he's argued that from about every conceivable angle, we get to chapter 5 and 6, and he's going to say, okay, now here's what it looks like to live this out in our communities and in actual unity on the ground. And he says this in, in the beginning of chapter 5 where he kind of sums all this up. He says, you've been severed from Christ. You are who, seeking, you who are seeking to be justified by, and I should have said fill in the blank up there, right? Um, for we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Can you imagine how radical and how heretical those words sounded in Paul's day. Can you imagine telling a Jew circumcision doesn't mean a thing? How's that going to sit? Right? And there's a lot of book, chapter, and verse to show it does mean something. Right? But he says, you know, when you boil it all down, Circumcision, uncircumcision, that doesn't mean anything. Faith working through love. Even if we interpret that as just a rhetorical flourish, it's a pretty intense statement. So what is the thing? If that means nothing, what is the thing? Faith working through love. Faith in the New Testament is not just a mental assent of some claims or some body of beliefs, right? It's not like, okay, do you believe this and this and this and this and this? That's not faith in, in the Bible. Faith in the New Testament is a two-way relationship. 
It's a relationship that creates communities. Um, and, and to set this in its just uh, ancient Greco-Roman context, you could see that the gods, the emperors, the army commanders from their perspective would have been faithful. They're trustworthy. They're loyal to their devotees, their subjects, their soldiers under their command. And then the worshipers of the gods, the subjects of the emperor, the soldiers under the commander's authority are their fi- their bo- blah, blah, blah thereby summoned to an answering faithfulness, loyalty, trustworthiness, devotion to duty. That's a quote from a scholar who's done this deep dive in the language of pistis and fides. But the idea here is like, do you, do you see what's happening? You've got the, the, the god or the emperor or the army commander, right, who has a faithfulness. And the people under them respond in faith, right? Respond in trust and allegiance, right? And so faith is what? It's relationship. It's this two-way relationship. Isn't that exactly what we see in Christ? In Galatians here, Christ is faithful, especially in his death on the cross. And we respond how? In faith. We put our trust in him. We place our faith in him. We give him our allegiance. And then here in Galatians, faith, right, that is this two-way relationship of loyalty and allegiance, right, is manifested in a very specific way. Love. Allegiance to the gods looked like what? Sacrifices and the cultic rituals and all those kinds of things. Right? Uh, allegiance to the army commander looked like what? Right? Strict obedience and, and uh, bravery on the battlefield and things like that. What's faith in Christ, allegiance to Christ, look like? It looks like Christ. It looks like his love. And... and, and, and for sake of time, I won't belabor this point in Galatians, but we could just keep going where he sums up the, the whole world, wor, the whole world, the whole word, what am I trying to say? The whole law is fulfilled in a word. And what is that one word? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And how do we fulfill the law of Christ? Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Right? And, and while we still have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those of the household of faith. You see, like from every angle, right, what does Paul keep bringing it back to? Allegiance to Christ, faithfulness to Christ looks like what? Like, like love. You can expand that. You can, you can look at it in more detail, and, and that's where you get the various lists of vices or virtues. But when you sum it all up, We're always talking about the same thing. And so love then is that test or that sign or that pattern. Over and over and over and over again, the scriptures continue to bring us back to the same center point. And I recognize that some might want to say that's too simple or that's too simplistic or or maybe fear. That's just an overreaction to like legalism and a pendulum swing from one extreme to the next. The love that I'm talking about, though, and the love that we continue to see over and over and over again in the scriptures is not an oversimplification and is not an overreaction. I'm talking about love in the fullest, most expansive, universal, and eternal sense. And if someone says, that's an oversimplification, all I can say is you don't yet know the love of Christ. And I don't have the power <laughs> to show you. We can do the textual work, right? I can, I can argue it intellectually, and we can, we can go from book to book to verse to verse and just see over and over and over again the same point. But this, what I'm talking about goes far beyond the intellectual point, right? We're talking about a knowing that is relationship, a knowing that is experience, And I can't manufacture experiential knowledge, knowing of God. At most, I can simply echo Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, 
from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that we can be filled up with all the fullness of God. I can pray, right? And it's up to the Spirit to be at work. So how do we know who's faithful to Christ? How do we recognize true followers of Christ from those who simply claim the name of Christ Love is that ultimate and central test, sign, pattern by which we can tell. But love is not just the test or sign or pattern. Love is also then that thing that holds us together, the way we actually maintain fellowship and grow in unity. You could say love is the way. We could see this in Galatians. That's really what's going on uh, in, in this context of five through six, right? He's argued already that we are one in fellowship with one another as the people of God. In chapters five through six, we find more practical teaching how to then live as one as the people of God. That's really what's going on in the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit, right? When, when you look at the works of the flesh, what do all those things have in common? He could have, he could have mentioned anything we might call a sin, but in that context, What's so significant about that list of vices? It's all community-destroying stuff. It's the stuff that tears people apart and destroys relationships. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? What do all those things have in common, all those virtues? This is the stuff that makes community, that builds community, that maintains unity, that holds us together. For simplicity's sake, I want to just note this point in Ephesians. Chapters 1 through 3, Paul has walked us through the big picture of what God has been doing in the world in Christ and in his church and the oneness, this one new humanity that we are belonging to now because of what Christ has done and the work of the Spirit. In chapter 4, he begins to tell us, okay, now how, here's how we live this out. Here's how we, we're meant to look here's how we're meant to live this out in our own lives, in our own churches, right? How, how, how God's will is done on earth as in heaven, we could say. And he he opens up this way in chapter 4. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What does it mean to walk worthy of this calling? We're diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How do we do that? How do we preserve this unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? Does he say that we have to agree on everything? By agreeing on the issues? Nope. (laughs) We're back to the character of Christ. Humility, gentleness, patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. When you think of debates and you think of divisions, do you often think or see this character at work in those events? Humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance for one another and love. Those are the things that often get left out to argue the issues. Go back to our marriage illustration from from a few weeks ago, right? I had everybody raise their hands and ask if, if you all agree on everything, right? Anybody work that out? You agree on everything now with your wife. You had three, four weeks now to do that, so hopefully you figured it out. Um, no, we recognize, okay, you're, you're, you don't stay together in your marriages because you agree on everything, right? But there's something deeper. There's something greater. There's something much fuller, something much more long-lasting that holds you together. Now let's build on that a little bit more. Do issues come up? Yeah, right? Like all the time. Like the, the, the issues that you might disagree over, right? That you see something you want to argue about and talk through. 
When an issue comes up, do you just like bury it under the rug? I know some do. Is that healthy? No. You talk about it, and sometimes you fight about it, right? But how do you get through it? I imagine it looks something like humility, gentleness, patience, showing tolerance for one another, and love. The same stuff Paul builds on to say, here's how churches stay together. Here's how the people of God live together as one. So do we see this? According to the scriptures, according to the gospel, fellowship is not defined by issues. It's defined by Christ. And fellowship is not maintained by agreeing on the issues, but having the character of Christ at work in the way we treat each other. The same thing that shows that we are the followers of Christ is the same thing that holds us together in unity as the followers of Christ. Right? Love is the test. Love is the way. And while we're at it, I can't avoid talking about First John for just a second. Love is also the end. Love is also the end. Paul, or Paul, John writes, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. You guys have heard me reference this one once or twice. I, it's just one of the most amazing sentences in all the Bible when you understand all what he's saying here. I won't unpack all of this again, but the idea is when, when we live out the love that we have come to know through the gospel, that is God's love reaching its end or aim or goal in us. In other words, for John, God himself is love, right? You want to know who God is? You, you can sum it up in that sentence. God is love, and we come to know his love. His love was manifested in us that he gave his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. But what he says there is that's just the beginning of his love being manifested to us. That's, that's our entry into this journey of love. It reaches its end. It reaches its goal or its aim when that love has so transformed us that it is visible, visceral, tangible, like you could cut through it with a knife in the community of God's people that you just see it. And God is seen in that. Love is not just one of the issues. Like, it's the thing. Do we see that? Got a bonus point. Oh, PowerPoint. What? You guys don't notice the blue thing. It doesn't mean anything to you, but uh, whatever. Bonus point. Did you guys know that the restoration movement began as a unity movement? I learned this like shortly before I moved to, came to Brownsburg. It blew my mind <laughs> when I learned this. Um, in the midst of a culture that was dominated by fighting and division over creeds and over the minutia of the Westminster Confession and other traditions that, that were going on in the various churches, early guys like Stone and Campbell sought to bring unity by going back to the Bible, right? The whole go back to the Bible, restore stuff was aimed at unity. That was the reason for it. They didn't realize at the time how much their methods only led to further division, but unity was at least the intent, not simply, we'd say, restoration for restoration's sake. And in the process of like throwing out the, the creeds and confessions and some of the other com common traditions at the time, there were these slogans that emerged through preaching and through, article, or through articles that were written. And, and many of these slogans have entered our collective consciousness and, and really become just kind of default uh, starting point for, for many of the assumptions that we carry. See if, if any of these sound familiar. Have you ever heard, speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent? Yeah, we've, we've all heard that, right? The fuller quote is this, where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we're silent. Just an example of the kind of slogan that was there. It's in our collective consciousness and understanding and, and defines very much many of our starting points. Uh, another one, uh, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. Have you heard that one? Or again, at least the spirit of that. Um, or do Bible things in Bible ways. Have you heard that, that line before, right? Again, it's just these, these slogans that were there, right? And, and many of those like really great, I, I mean, still, there's, there's a lot of goodness in that. Uh, have you ever heard this one before? 
we are Christians only. Um, I, the way I'd, I'd heard it often was we are simply Christians. Uh, in fact, when I first started preaching at Lafayette, we had this little, I don't you remember, it was like a correspondence course, or a, it was in the track rack. You guys know what track racks are, right? Uh, but it was this uh, a little, little pamphlet called We Are Simply Christians, right? It's getting to this idea of like, we just want to be Christians. We don't want to have all this extra stuff to it. Does anybody know, besides Tyler, I know he knows this one too, the second half of this line? Micah knows it. We are Christians only, but not the only Christians. Doesn't that blow your mind? We are Christians only, but not the only Christians. Recognize the attitudes that these early guys carried towards others who didn't agree with them on these things that they were seeing in Scripture, who didn't agree with them on the issues. Though they remained unflinchingly convicted, and if you read their, the things they wrote, I mean, talk about conviction. We're not talking about chucking conviction out, but they had conviction. But though they remained unflinchingly convicted by their views over the issues, they had an incredibly generous spirit towards those who didn't agree with them. They continued to see them as in Christ and in fellowship. The generous spirit didn't last long. Many people who kind of picked up that teaching focused on the restoration part. And, and in, even in their own lifetime, right, the sectarianism, the division seemed to be the thing that caught on and the unity got lost or the other half of this, this sentence. What began as a uni- unity movement through restoration became a restoration movement that only led to more and more division. Now, why am I telling you all this? It's not Bible. It's not authority in that sense. But it is where we come from, whether we acknowledge it or not or want to acknowledge it or not, right? That's just the stream that we, we, we come from, right? If we're going to be in the business of restoration, I want to make a suggestion. Start with Jesus the Christ, who he is, what he's done, what we, he was about, what he taught, how he lived, obsess over Jesus. And in that, learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And in that, learn what it means to live in community with disciples of Jesus. Because the reality is, a rogue disciple is not a thing in Scripture. We're meant to live in, in fellowship with one another. Right? And then if you're doing that, you'll be led to sort of step back and see how all this fits together in the big picture of the Bible. Start there and see where that takes us. And if we're going to be asking these questions about fellowship, don't just turn to random verses and proof texts and justify why we're right and why everyone else is wrong. Again, start with Jesus. I'm saying like, like really start with Jesus. Start with who he was and the purity of his message about him and his teaching. And when it comes to working it all out on the ground, don't start with what you disagree on. Start with what you agree on at the most fundamental and important levels and then build on that foundation and, 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 um, and, and build out that foundation and work, work from there. That requires a lot of humility requires a lot of wisdom to work all this out on the ground. And that may look different from one local church to the other, but my, my aim, my hope in this as we talk about these things, this sermon, the last few, is that what this, this, these things do is just shift the paradigm enough, not just in how we relate to each other and may or may not work through issues together, but, but much more fundamentally just our attitudes, the attitudes that we carry with us in the ways that we think about ourselves, think about each other, think about others. I want to close with the heart of Christ. It's what Clark read for us. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who also believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, 
you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, in oneness, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you've given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known you that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus is about to die when he prays these things. And what is weighing so heavily on his heart in this prayer? The unity of his followers. Not just Peter, Andrew, James, and John, but those who would believe in him through their word. That's us. That's everyone alive today who claims any connection to Jesus whatsoever. Right? That, that he has that scope. So what, what does he want? You know, we can list commands. We can, you want to know the heart of Christ? This is it. And if we're knowing him, and, and, and that's doing something in us, like some t- at some point or another, this is going to be on our heart as well, that this becomes the thing that we strive after and live for. So I commend to you the heart of Jesus and all that. We'll have an opportunity now for silence and reflection and prayer and for those who want to share burdens that we can help you bear. If you're ready to be baptized, we hold space for you in this as well. But let's all, please take this to heart. Take these words of Christ into your own heart. Let them fill you up in the fullest way. Let's be still. Our Father, we love you and we're so grateful. Please help us. Please take these words of Christ, this prayer of Christ, and plant it deep in our hearts that it would grow up and bear fruit in our lives and transform every aspect of who we are and what we're about. May we grow up into this and and share in the the answering of this prayer that we could that we could live it out and and share in that we are in awe of you and your purpose and so honored that we can be considered your children and be called into this same incredible work in the name of Jesus I pray amen